Hello, everyone. We welcome to the research method se session of ASM 2020. Um, we're going to start the first presentation, which is a paper entitled Case Service Studies in Software Engineering Research. And it is going to be presented by Giorgi Melegati. So, Giorgi, uh, please Thank make the presentation. Thank you, Marco. Marcos. Uh, just start sharing. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, hello. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So I'm, my name is George Miragati, and I'm from the Free University of Pozzo in Bozzano, Italy. And as Marco said, I'm here to present our paper, Case Survey Studies in Software Engineering Research. So I will start with our motivation. So we've seen in the last two decades, at least, there's a large interest on human aspects of software development. So we, we stopped to focus only on technical aspects like programming, coding, uh, architecture, and moved also to organizational aspects, cognitive aspects of software development, since it's uh, human-led. So this interest led to the use of several research methods from social sciences, like case studies, ethnographies, ground theory. And this movement led to several uh, papers, methodological papers in software engineering venues about this method. And more recently, we've seen another important method, uh, the case survey method. So what's this case survey? So uh, the goal is to bring the strengths of the two well-known methods, the case study. A case study is an empirical inquiry that investigates a contemporary phenomenon within its real-life context. So in summary, the goal is to get an in-depth investigation of a complex phenomenon. A survey, on the other hand, is a method to collect and summarize evidence from a large representative sample of the overall population. So based on a statistical model or a model of the population, you can drive a sample of this population and based on a generally uh, an instrument, generally as a questionnaire, you can get data from this sample and draw conclusions on the overall uh, population. So the case survey, it's the goal is to, you, you draw statistical uh, generalizations, but based on data collected through case studies. So in that uh, data, generally for more complex, uh, Phenomena. So the goal is a wider generalization for this complex phenomena. So, but so far, uh, for this method, the, the most common uh, guidelines are were proposed for for life by Larson, and basically uh, the author mentions four steps. So in the first step, you select a group of existing case studies published, not necessarily in uh, peer-reviewed venues, but in an in-depth description of these uh, cases. Once you have this, you design a coding scheme based on your research questions or research goals uh, to convert these case descriptions into quantitative variable. And you, using this coding scheme, you use employ multiple raters, multiple people perform this coding, and then you can analyze the uh, the agreement between them, if it makes sense. And finally, you can stati statistically analyze these results and bring uh, your conclusions. So far, uh, several papers use this method in software engineering, but we haven't seen if they follow uh, thoroughly uh, the, uh, the guidelines so far. So we performed uh, uh, our research following the the, this research question, uh, how do software engineering researchers employ the case survey method? So to answer our research question, we perform a systematic mapping study. Uh, we develop this query string. Uh, we use different terms used to describe case study. And we use our really broad uh, query string to get all everything and uh, we remove the, the things that were not related to the, our study in the next step. So we just use software here. 
So we performed our search in IEEE, ACM, Digital Libraries, Corpus, and Web of Science, and we got 511 non-duplicated results. After the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we analyzed 12 steps. So the results are interesting. First of all, uh, a, a little bit of a review. So 10 out of 12, the studies that we identified uh, were published in the last four years. They were uh, published in top venues. So we have papers in PSE, Empirical Software Engineering, Journal, IST, JSS, NICSI. And 11 out of 12 used directly uh, citing Larson's guideline or cites another paper that when you, we went there to the other page cited and they and this paper used guide, uh, Larson's guidelines. So uh, 11, uh, um, the large majority uses these guidelines, but uh, our main conclusion is that researchers uh, in software engineer apply the method in different ways. Uh, to describe each type, it's too, too long, for this presentation, I will give an overview. I invite everybody, uh, anyone who is interested to check our paper. So in five papers, that was the most common way. It was to, uh, be, uh, to call case survey a primary investigation using a limited data. That is, uh, the researchers themselves collect this data on a large number of phenomena of the instance of this phenomenon they were analyzing. And they analyzed mainly employing qualitative or simple statistical analysis, generally descriptive analysis. Uh, our criticism on using calling this case survey that is not in-depth analysis like you, you expect in a case, uh, in a case study. Um, uh, other two papers made something really similar, but focus on studies published by the same authors. Uh, so this is, the person is always is similar. Uh, another common understanding is our use of, it was like a multiple case study with a large number of cases. Uh, again, the, it was primary data generally collected by the authority team. And as an exam, as two examples, we have this from Peterson and colleagues that perform uh, quantitative analysis on cases in a large number of cases, I would say 23, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it's interesting on this paper that they, they, they managed to collect probably many cases because the authoring team was 10 people. So they probably managed to collect many data. So, uh, I would say, we would say this is the really boundary between a case survey and a multiple case uh, uh, study. Uh, another uh, paper that we classify in this cluster was from Papateo Carlos and colleagues that used the method to validate uh, an artifact they, they themselves pro uh, analyzed. So obviously it was also a, a large number of cases, but again, uh, it was uh, evaluating their own uh, artifacts. So they collected data. It was not previous published cases. So our overall conclusion is that there is a, a lack of adherence to the method description. And as consequences, we see that, it's a that we see a difficulty to, to evaluate the study validity. Because when you claim that a uh, a method is uh, is used. It brings a lot of understanding. Uh, the, the reviewers and the reader expect something to evaluate that uh, the credibility of that study. So if you're calling something different, uh, this is threatened. This this mechanism. So we hope with our work that it serves as a guide to authors, to researchers, to use the case survey method and also to reviewers and readers to see what they should expect from a case survey study. And overall, we want to call the attention to the community to a proper use of this method. I would just want to add that we ourselves have a, one of the papers uh, that we evaluated. It was also a case survey and we also made mistakes. So 
it's not to point fingers, but it's to call the uh, the awareness of for this problem. And uh, thank you. And thank you here for the question. Presentation. Um, we have some questions for you to answer. Uh, the first question is from Haya Halonen. What were the reasons to choose those databases that were chosen in the current study? Uh, we mentioned that on the paper as well. Uh, we followed a guideline for systematic mapping studies. And they generally say that IEEE and ACM, you always should see and uh, check, and at least two other um, databases and we chose the Scopus because it's really broad and another one web of science basically. okay uh, another question uh, from uh, professor Marcelo Janeiro uh, really I do not understand the specific goals of case uh, case surveys could you comment an example to illustrate the advantages yeah sure uh, the goal is uh, to get a general generalizable result, let's say, through a, qualita a quantitative analysis, statistical analysis, like a survey, but when you have a more complex um, phenomenon, that it's harder to get from a, a questionnaire and so on. So you can try to, of course, you need to have uh, available in the, in the literature several published case studies that describe these cases in detail so you can analyze these these cases and through this coding scheme draw the convert this qualitative in that uh, the data to quantitative data and draw statistical general results statistical generalizable results okay um, there is one more uh, question I'm not sure about completely got the question right, but uh, Maya, uh, Nikki Netkov, a question from Nikki Netkov, uh, it says, Maya, method description, not enough explicitness, or not complying to case study or study methodological guidelines. I, I think that she's asking about the, the com yeah. compliance to the guidelines, right? And yeah, I would say it's not complying to case survey methodological guidelines. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much um, you. for the presentation. We are going to move now to the second presentation. Let me just uh, quickly um, switch the presenter. Hello. And now we have uh, Michel Felderer, who is going to present the second paper, which is called uh, Why Research on Test-Driven Development is Inconclusive. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thanks for the introduction. I will present now our paper, Why Research on Test-Driven Development is Inconclusive. This is work uh, done together with Mohamed Gafari, Tim Gross, and Davide Fucci. Unfortunately, others are traveling, so uh, it left me over to actually present our paper. So first, to motivate uh, the topic, I mean, uh, test-driven uh, development... Sorry to interrupt, but can you please share your slides? I can. I cannot see your slides. On have I don't have them on the screen. You have to uh, add the uh, share, share screen option on the yes on Streamyard. I try. Oops. So now I should. Yes. Now we have your slides. Okay. okay. Sorry, um, I will. Again, here you can see our the title and uh, the authors, uh, and I will continue with the actual presentation. So, uh, actually, test-driven development has been around for uh, 20 years, and uh, it came up with uh, agility, and there have been many studies on the topic, as uh, we all know, and the results that they actually present are somehow contradictory and inconclusive. For instance, with respect to code quality, one of the largest SLRs in the field shows that uh, there are no significant, uh, not, that the results are not significant, but other low rigor and low relevant studies show that uh, there is an impact on DDD with respect to the code quality. The same holds for productivity. 
And these uh, diverging results make it impossible to categorically provide evidence on the usefulness and efficiency of uh, test-driven development. And the goal of this research actually was to identify factors that contribute to inconclusive research results on test-driven development. This may help to further guide research, uh, but also uh, to help practitioners to select whether a study on test-driven development is actually relevant because of the factors that impact the outcome. Our research process, I just want to sketch it shortly. We started with secondary studies that we extracted from one uh, meter review, so from one sec uh, third uh, level study. And from that, from these nine secondary studies, um, we did some kind of uh, backward snowballing and extracted primary studies. Uh, that were published between 2009 and uh, 2017. And based on that, uh, we did a content analysis, so where we actually extracted the goals of the study, uh, presented the setup, the findings, and the reported and not reported threats so that we ex extracted ourselves. Based on that, we formed the factor uh, taxonomy of factors that uh, actually impact the reported results and cause uh, the uh, cause these uh, differences. And uh, finally, after we had a saturation that no, when no factors were added, we stopped. In addition uh, to triangulate these results, we also uh, collected primary studies in top venues, top journals, top conferences on testing and uh, processes that were published after uh, the last secondary study that we considered and classified them also according to our uh, factor taxonomy. Okay, this is just, uh, you can also find in the paper, these are the nine secondary studies that we took from the meter review and uh, used for the backward snowballing and to get an initial overview. And these are the 10 primary studies that we collected in the top venues from uh, 2018 to April 2020. And the interesting thing is that uh, none of these uh, papers were published in top testing conferences like ICSD and ISTA, but more in journals and in the process conferences. So there is also space in that community to investigate more on the TDD. So let me proceed now with the actual core figure of my presentation, which are the factors contributing to inconclusiveness of uh, outcomes on a TDD research. So on the right, you see the actual outcomes that are investigated in studies. These are outcomes related to code quality, may it be the internal quality, like the maintenance of the code, may it be the external one, so the quality of uh, the resulting product, and may it be the quality of the actual test code. All of them are relevant, and in addition, there are also reported outcomes on the productivity, may it be on the productivity of the individual developer or of the team the developer works in. And the factors that we extracted from the literature that actually influence uh, whether such reported outcomes are inconclusive are uh, the applied uh, definition of test-driven development, the participant selection, the task selection, the type of project, and uh, the comparison. And in the remainder of my talk, I just want to browse quickly through these uh, components, and you will find them in the paper described in detail. So the first... Um, aspect is the outcome. Uh, I mean, if you consider isolation, then there we found that mostly short-term impact of test-driven development is reported, but not so much long-term benefits and drawbacks, which manifest themselves once the software is in use. Um, this holds especially for uh, the quality of the test suites. Yeah, uh, With respect to the quality of the test suites, um, so Factors considered are complexity, uh, code coverage, and mutation score, and others do not uh, consider that at all. This is just a first remark on this uh, topic, but now let's go into the factors. So the first one is the uh, applied DDD definition, and there we found that a variety of DDD definitions uh, are applied. So the exact meaning, the underlying assumptions, and how strictly one follows it, this is often not well explained in many of the previous studies. Yeah, So actually, you can boil down DDD mostly to the issue that uh, tests are 
uh, written prior to production codes, but often it stays unclear whether refactoring plays a role in the applied uh, definition in a specific study uh, and which for sure may impact the outcome, but also uh, whether the design uh, of the application that also impacts uh, the testing is known upfront or not. The second uh, factor is the participant selection. Uh, there we found that studies uh, consider students um, or professionals, um, mostly with little prior knowledge uh, on DDD um, and also with uh, different number of participants, so which may impact the study. So you can see here in the these two figures, we actually classified uh, studies according um, to that uh, aspect. Uh, I mean, you can, for instance, see that no industrial study contains more than 40 participants. And with respect to the experience that people have uh, when they start uh, DDD, we see uh, one week between half a year is very common, but uh, higher or longer lasting experience is very rare. Uh, however, there are also studies uh, that show that the experience is important. So participant selection is also a very important factor to consider. Then the third one is the task selection. Most studies uh, consider a synthetic non-real world task. So they are dominant and the research does not cover the variety of tasks to which test-driven development can be applied. Also, the importance of task granularity is not well uh, considered. And the interesting aspect here is that synthetic tasks are even dominant in experiments conducted in industrial settings. So not only in the academic setting where it's, let's say, more, um, where it makes more sense uh, that non-trivial tasks are take into account. Then the type of the project uh, is also a very big issue, especially when practitioners want to interpret results of TTT studies. So the problem is that research on TTT mostly focuses on greenfield projects rather than brownfield projects. So accordingly, the opportunity to apply TTT in an existing code base is unclear. Yeah? So if you uh, have studies that uh, show the impact on uh, code quality or desk quality, and they are done on um, greenfield projects. So the actual uh, possibility to make some statements on brownfield projects, which are really very rare. You can see in the uh, table below, only two report brownfield settings uh, are then very limited. And finally, uh, the comparison aspect is also very important when it comes uh, to the aspect of uh, interpreting the outcome or the power of the outcome, whether there is an impact on the uh, on the quality or on the productivity, because um, often uh, DDD is not compared against other relevant settings. Yeah? So often in the past, there was a comparison um, towards or against pure waterfall settings, which uh, may not be realistic. Um, so settings that actually uh, are there are on the one hand iterative test last. So if you compare DDD against uh, not only a waterfall test last, but an iterative one where you also consider uh, iterations of uh, reasonable, reasonably low duration, uh, then pure test last, so this is more the waterfall setting. You see also such studies are uh, common, then your way means uh, it was not really clear toward, towards which uh, approach uh, test-driven development is uh, compared against. And there are also studies uh, that compare different variants of test-driven development. One is this uh, paper from Karaj et al. that is cited, which uh, compares the uh, impact uh, that the task granularity has on test-driven development. Okay, with this, I come to the end of my presentation. So in our paper, we discussed important factors that are responsible for inconclusiveness um, on DDD research. So these five factors are the applied definition of uh, DDD, then the participant selection in studies, the task selection, the type of the project that is considered, and finally, uh, the comparison uh, 
of uh, the approach. And our work should pave the way to conduct studies that produce more uh, converging results on DTD, as we really found uh, this inconclusive contradictory results, which are mainly due to the reported factors and should also highlight those factors that are important uh, to consider when interpreting research results, maybe as a researcher or as a practitioner, or when selecting studies that are relevant to you, especially, for instance, if you consider this brownfield setting, yeah, then maybe mainly this brownfield studies may be relevant to you. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Many thanks, and now I'm open to questions. So, Michael, thank you very much for the timely presentation. Um, I have one question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, these, these uh, guidance that you're providing for conducting new studies, uh, what do you think would be an ideal way to, ha to handle such studies? Uh, 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 they might probably require some, some kind of network so that you can uh, conduct replications also. Do you have any advice based on your, um, based on your experience on your study uh, on how such study following the guidance that you're providing in your last mm -hmm. slide? I mean, yeah, um, good question. I mean, I would not really consider it as guidelines in the sense because we just report the factors and do not derive uh, pro uh, guidelines, but I think it's a very good aspect to turn these factors maybe in, in guidelines, right? And uh, a core part uh, may then be to actually uh, let's say classify your study according to the to these uh, factors yeah so to really make clear where to position it and uh, i think this already helps uh, to make clear what the contribution of the study make, can be what to what past studies you can compare can compare the results to and so on okay there is one more question from pilar rodriguez how do you think we can do to improve the situation so to be able to provide more conclusive results in the future? How should these factors be considered? So mm -hmm. I, can... I think this relates a bit uh, to, the, to the question uh, before. Uh, I think uh, an area where, uh, yeah, so, I mean, report and properly position your planned study in uh, this uh, setting. Uh, I mean, what we can provide is we can provide an overview of what has been reported, so the, cat, uh, the characteristic of the studies performed with respect to the factors. Um, I mean, at the moment it's in the paper, but uh, there some kind of a map can be applied and, and, and shown. And then uh, there are especially let's say areas uh, where there are gaps where studies are needed. I mean, one thing is the brownfield, uh, then the impact on the test code quality, and maybe also more long-term effects. These are things that are actually missing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there were lots of messages also from people cheering to you. And, uh, um, and we had a, a huge audience, by the way. We, we, we passed the mark of 130 people watching in several times, so it's a really, impressive number for the first session of ESM. Happy that, that these numbers are looking this way. Uh, so I'm going, moving to the third, uh, third presentation, Great. which is the presentation by Niti. So um, Michael, I will blend you out, okay? Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, Niti, hello, hi Niti. Niti, Niti is hi. going to present uh, the paper um, on cohort studies in software engineering, a vision of the future. So Niti, uh, can you please share your screen? Yes, okay. I will blend myself out and have a nice presentation, okay? Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. So I'm gonna present uh, our vision of how software engineering research could actually benefit from uh, adopting a cohort study method methodology from the medicine. Uh, so software engineering researchers currently have several data sources that they can use from online. These include, for example, uh, version control systems, issue trackers, and continuous integration uh, platforms. And these are especially used in mining software repository studies. Uh, and currently they have quite large data sets that they analyze in their studies. However, uh, they are usually not controlled experiments, but case studies, uh, which means that in practice they cannot prove causality. And quite often it's discussed in the threats to validity section of these papers, 
uh, as you can see from these examples. So here they all say that they cannot claim causation because they are only case studies. But our vision is that you, by applying these new methodologies, so cohort studies in this uh, case, you could do MSR studies, but get a higher level of evidence. And we would borrow these methodologies from medicine. Um, and in medicine, they have for the different methodologies, they kind of have an idea about which methodologies provide higher level of evidence than other. So the highest ones are, as also we have like uh, the literature reviews. And uh, then you have the different kind of experimental studies, uh, just as we do in software engineering. But then uh, they have something that we don't, which is the analytical observational studies and descriptive observational studies. Uh, we do have case studies which kind of go on the same level of evidence than descriptive studies, but they are not one-to-one. -one. And then at the bottom you have expert opinions, which in our field are interviews and surveys. So our vision is to kind of fill this blank over here by taking the analytical observational studies and applying them to software engineering. So analytical observational studies have the same goal as controlled experiments. Uh, they want to find if there is a relationship between an exposure, so an independent variable, and an dependent variable. And if a study methodology is analytical, that means that it compares at least two groups. So, uh, for example, controlled experiments are analytical. And then observational studies, um, they, in those, the researchers cannot assign the treatment to the study participants, but instead uh, they only observe and measure the natural behavior of the study participants. And there are a few methodologies you can use, but we are going to focus on cohort studies. And what's great about cohort studies is that you can do them prospectively, so as controlled experiments, so you can follow the subjects into the future and collect the data, or you can do them retrospectively by using already existing data. And that is especially great for MSR studies because they already have all this data available and existing. So then we're going to go to give it a more kind of concrete feeling about how cohort studies are conducted on a very high level. So first, uh, you of course select the independent and dependent variable. In software engineering, I mean, that could be uh, some kind of code smell and uh, whether whether the thing that we are inspecting is faulty. Then you have to select your study populations um, in software engineering. That could be Java classes from Apache Software Foundation. Uh, and then in cohort study, you follow the subject through time. That can be two months or two years, depending on your research. And at this stage, you have to make sure that your population are not affected by the outcome at the start of your study. So in this case, the classes would not be faulty. And then uh, you also measure the exposure at the baseline. So you make sure you check whether the classes are affected by code smells or they are not affected by code smells. And then what you do, then you just follow them through the time to the two months, two years, whatever. And then at the end, you measure the outcome. So whether the classes ended up being faulty or not. And then uh, you do the the uh, data analysis and get your results by analyzing the uh, population in these four groups. So that's cohort study on a very, very high level. And I've been talking about how cohort studies could provide higher level of evidence and actually you could maybe get even to causality. So what is required to say that we have causality? So it requires three things. First of all, you need to have a clear empirical association between the independent and dependent variable. Uh, then you need to make sure that the independent variable preceded uh, the dependent variable. So in cohort, in the previous case, the uh, participants, uh, the classes weren't faulty at the start of the uh, uh, experiment. And then lastly, you need to make sure that the relationship that you observed is not uh, confounded by any third variables. So in a controlled experiment, that's kind of, well, not easy, but in that sense, because you can do uh, randomization, but that cannot be done in a cohort study because you cannot assign the treatment. So they have these other things that you can do, but 
the main thing here is that in a cohort study, the list is very different from controlled experiments, and it does take more work than in a controlled experiment. So then if we compare, so I said that if you want a co causation, you need to have clear empirical association between the variables. Well, usually you can get those in MSR studies and cohort studies. But then uh, the temporal precedence, um, well, in a cohort study, you always had it, you saw in the graph that you had to make sure it, it, that at the beginning, but it's not always done in an MSR study. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And then for controlling the confounding, um, it's always done in a cohort study because that's like how they make sure it's valid. Uh, it's done in planning, analysis, and discussion phases. But in MSR studies, it's sometimes done, sometimes not, but quite often it's dis at least discussed. And then the last thing is that um, sensitivity analysis is usually done in a cohort study, but it's almost never done in an MSR study. So there are these clear differences that cohort studies do take more work, but that's how you get the elevated level of evidence. So where are we going right now with our vision? So right now we've done phase one, so we do understand kind of how uh, cohort studies are done in other fields. And right now we are trying to uh, figure out how they work in our context, so MSR studies. And uh, when we get that done, we will uh, develop some kind of guidelines so it's easier for others to do them as well. And then the last phase would be to actually figure out whether uh, they could be applied to other contexts in software engineering. So in a nutshell, uh, stay tuned. We will provide some guidelines how everyone could, could apply the cohort studies in your research. So thank you. Thank you very much, Niti, for your presentation. Um, we have some comments in, in here, but I would like to, to pose a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, compared to you compared cohort studies to MSR studies. Yes. And what do you think? Uh, I, I mean, there, there's some implications of your research which could lead to um, advice to, to better conduct MSR studies uh, uh, towards causality. Uh, so do you think the cohort studies would be, the, the guidelines that you're preparing for cohort studies would be something in this direction? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the idea is to give the MSR community a new methodology that they could use if they want to, that like in theory should give higher level evidence than just con just conducting uh, case studies. Okay, there's another uh, point by uh, Jorge Melegati, and he said that I had the feeling that case studies were put as not so good research method. I think there are a lot of discussion on software engineering research arguing in favor of case studies. Could you mention something on that? Well, the idea in cohort studies is not to study individual cases, but populations. So I, I'm not saying that case studies are not good, but I'm saying that studying populations does give you more evidence than just inspecting like one things. Okay. I might use some comments by your advisor to help here also. Um, uh, he also answered uh, uh, while during, during the discussion here. So there are also some comments on the on YouTube with answers from David. Um, there is one, one more question by Afnan al Subain. Uh, in your opinion, is it easy, reliable to investigate the non-existence of, of confounding factors to detect causality confidentially? I wouldn't say it's easy. It definitely needs work, but I think it's doable. You just need to do work for that. Nice. Um, another question here by uh, Paul Roth. Uh, great presentation, Niti. Applying a cohort model to MSR would lead to better research in many cases. He is actually uh, claiming what, what you just mentioned, right? And there is one more by Valdemar Ferreira. Did you perform a cohort study according to your claims as an evaluation? Not yet, but we are planning. It's in the like the next step that we are going to do. Okay. So thank you very much. We are out of time for questions. Thank you very much for the uh, timely and nice presentation. So we're moving to the last presentation of the day um, of this session. Sorry. 
which is by Vilma uh, Nepomucem. So I'm, I'm blending you out. Nitin, thank you very much. Hi. Bye. Hi, Vilma. Vilma is going to present a paper um, called uh, Avoiding Plagiarism in Systematic Literature Reviews, an update concern. Uh, can you please share your screen, Vilma? Okay, just a second. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. This is the presentation, right? Okay. Right. So uh, you have seven to eight minutes plus two minutes for questions. So uh, I'll, I'll blend me out and leave you to present, okay? Have a nice presentation. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will present the paper entitled Avoiding Plagiarism in Systematic Literature Reviews and Update Concern. Uh, in recent years, we had explosion of S SLRs in software engineering. Uh, but one point that is not addressed yet is the possibility to commit plagiarism when you are conducting SLRs, especially when we are dealing with SLR maintenance activities, especially updates. Uh, in our research, we have two research questions. The first one is, can SLR maintenance lead to plagiarism issues? And the second one is, how can plagiarism issues be avoided dur during SLR maintenance? Uh, we know that can be a problem to be analyzed, but uh, in this research, we do not focus on plagiarism problems uh, in the primary studies. Uh, in this research, we conduct a survey and some structured interviews uh, where we asked for experts in conducting SLRs about SLR plagiarism problems in maintenance. And we also uh, made a comparison between SLR updates and their original SLRs. Uh, in this figure, uh, we can see the result of a comparison between uh, SLR, SLR updates that we retrieved from a systematic mapping we conducted before and their original studies. Uh, the comparison was made using the COP Spider 2 uh, and this limit of 3% presented in, the, in this figure is used, is used by the two to indicate some possible plagiarism uh, problems. Uh, we can see here uh, that from the 22 studies, eight do not present plagiarism issues and 13 present. Uh, in this table, uh, we present a, a deeper analysis in the, uh, in the COP Spider report, and we investigate the sessions uh, that present some plagiarism problems indicated by the COP Spider 2. And in 12 papers, uh, the section problem, the, the, the section method presents some problem uh, indication, uh, what uh, uh, is expected to the, the, the reuse of uh, research questions, inclusion exclusion criteria, uh, the search string, and other artifacts. And another section that is interesting is the reference with uh, three, uh, 13 Ks, uh, but it's also expected because uh, when you are updating uh, SLR, you, you are working in the same domain uh, that the older SLR. Uh, this value uh, for reference uh, could explain some right points uh, in this figure. And once we, the two run a just a test comparison between the, the, the studs and the original studs. Uh, for the conclusions, uh, for the first uh, research question, uh, we highlighted uh, the first one is that there is a higher possibility of committing plagiarism without the proper care. And the second one is there are characteristics in SLR maintenance, such as artifacts, data, and results re reuse, which can lead a, a researcher to commit plagiarism. And for the second research question, uh, we construct a, a set of tips to avoid plagiarism issues. And the first one is disclose up front if the work uh, is an SLR maintenance. Uh, clearly explain new primary studies 
added to original study, clear state new research questions and what is the impact on the final data vision. And in this case, the final data vision is the, the, the last impression we have about the, the, the findings retrieved in SLR conduction. And when you are conducting a, an SLR, maintains activity, the vision about a, a SLR can change. So uh, maybe the, the, the older uh, SLR uh, must be overlapped for the new one. Uh, clear state all change made to original SLR artifacts. Clear exposed change in the final data vision. Make a clear difference without uh, with previous vision. And whether new vision produced should replace the original one. Uh, clear indicated. Uh, already presented ideas using the previous work, uh, using reference or quotes, avoiding self-plagiarism is a, a, a very sensitive case, okay? Uh, because it's, it's very common uh, you use your previous work, uh, the, the tests and the words, and take care about this. Uh, using a plagiarism detection tool, uh, compare the new SLR with the old one, then if you find some overlapped content, uh, try to adjust when possible. And finally, uh, I give you a question uh, for a discussion and to think about it. Uh, if SLR prejudice is, is a real problem uh, or not, okay? So uh, thank you for your time, please. Okay, thank you very much, Vilma, for your presentation. Um, uh, we have we have uh, some questions here. One of them is uh, by Fabio Petrillo. Hi, Vilma, thanks for for your presentation. Is Copy Spider reliable? Uh, one of the, our future works is uh, to provide some uh, reliability about Copy Spider. Uh, we want to compare Copy Spider with other. Uh, plagiarism detection too. Uh, so we don't know uh, for now, but it's a, a, a point. It's a real point. Okay. There is another question by Martin Solari. Would you recommend specific plagiarism detection tools? Uh, maybe uh, you can try a lot of because uh, when when you when you use a plagiarism det detection tool. Uh, these these tools just made a, a test comparison, so uh, it's hard to 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 identify uh, some uh, some kind of uh, time issues in, in, in the, the the test because uh, in the case of reference, uh, uh, you have a a, a lot of uh, reused tests in the reference. It, it's it's very common, so the, the, the plagiarism detection tools maybe uh, cannot uh, validate these these comparisons very well when you are comparing uh, papers because the reference and methods and, and another points in the the, the, the paper. So I, I can't uh, recommend a specific one. Uh, just saying that you are to to use more than one. Okay. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, a question by Afnan uh, Subain. Um, was that table showing the prevalence of plagiarism according to parts of the report? If yes, why do you think methodology was highest? Yes, uh, 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 yes, is the uh, uh, compa uh, comparison uh, between the sessions, and the methodology is the, is the highest because. Uh, when you are uh, writing your paper, uh, in this case, an uh, update from an SLR, you, you probably reuse some taste from the uh, older SLR. Uh, in this case, you are using the, the, the search string. And if your search string is, is bigger, is, is big, Probably the, 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 the plagiarism detection tool we indicate is as a plagiarism problem. So uh, uh, you have some artifacts that you are reusing, inclusion, exclusion criteria, or, or other things. And the, the, the plagiarism detection tool we indicate is a plagiarism problem. 
Okay, since we have one more minute, uh, and, and with respect to the huge audience, we have two more questions, I will pose them to you, okay? okay. Um, one of them is, does the plagiarism invalidate the SLRs? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, the plagiarism probably will invalidate. What you have to analyze is it's a real plagiarism problem. So uh, if, you are, if you just run a, a plagiarism detection tool, uh, probably you will find plagiarism problems. But you, you have to deeper analyze these problems uh, that, that the, the plagiarism tool indicates and see if you are considering, if you can consider this plagiarism or not. Uh, not just run a detection tool and, yeah, it's a plagiarism. Okay, and the final question by Jefferson Moleri. Hi, Duma. Uh, did you take into account different types of plagiarism, self-plagiarism, mosaic, or direct plagiarism? Uh, in this research, we uh, just uh, used the, the self-plagiarism and the, the, the direct plagiarism, okay? So, uh, Probably we, we need to deeper this, this uh, analysis uh, for other types of plagiarism. Okay. Thank you very much. There are some other questions by other people, but I think we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, you can uh, post other questions directly to Vilma by contacting him or uh, by the email address that can be found in the paper, which is uh, provided in the proceedings. And uh, just to remind you, uh, within 10 minutes, we're going to have a next session which is going to be chaired by Michel Felder. It's a session on testing, security, and reliability, the first of two sessions on this topic, and it starts in 10 minutes. So therefore, I'm, uh, I'm finalizing this session. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we are going offline here in this session. See you in the next one. Bye-bye, cheers. Bye-bye.